Hi, my name's Maddie, and I work at the St. Louis Science Center. And today, we are at the St. Louis Science Center taking care of our honeybees. So even though we're in the middle of a pandemic, there's still work that is essential to make sure our plants and animals can thrive during this time. And today, Hannah Reinhardt, who is our plant and animal manager, is working to transfer our honeybees from their old boxes into some newer ones. So you'll be able to see that happening today. And Hannah has been working with bees and managing beehives for about seven or eight years. And she still considers herself a beginner. So as Hannah is moving, she's transferring the what are called the frames. So as Hannah's looking at this frame, you'll notice that at the bottom they've built some of their honeycomb underneath. Okay. This is not ideal. So that's a half frame that she inherited when we got the colony last year. So using the bigger frames would be easier in that box, but we were using what we had. You'll notice on the ground that before she even started transferring them, she had created a little fire in this little can that's on the ground, the smoke. So what the smoke does is actually relaxes the bees, which is good for both the bees and the, the person moving the bees. So Hannah is moving the frames from these old boxes to these newer ones because these old boxes were literally falling apart. So we want to make sure that the bees have a solid home to live in. Before we started today, Hannah talked a lot about wondering, like, what would the bees look like? How, how did they survive the winter? She hadn't looked at them since probably late last fall. And it's always an unknown. She remarked as soon as she opened them how glad she was to see like how much honey was still in there. They had plenty of, of fuel for the winter. And that was a relief. When you're moving bees, it's important to notice how quickly you're moving and to move as slowly as possible, which makes it easier for the bees to adjust. Now she'll be replacing the lid. And done, good job, Hannah. Before Hannah starts the transfer on the second box, she's putting in more pine needles, dried pine needles, and starting to smoke this box. Same reason as we talked about before, just to kind of chill out the bees and relax them. Hannah's decided to take another look inside the box after all of the frames have been placed because she didn't notice much sign of, of brood. There was only healthy brood on two of the frames. So she's gonna go back in and look for signs of eggs and also the queen. So one of the things that we've been discussing is you know, confirming that the queen is still with the hive so that's what she's looking for now. As she's expecting, she's only noticed a few eggs or what she thinks are eggs. And on the current frame she's looking on, she's observed what she thinks might be something called a swarm cell. And a swarm cell could indicate that they are trying to make a new queen. So after inspecting the frames, Hannah was unable to find the queen and isn't confident that the few cells she saw that looked like they had eggs in them were actually that. Normally, it's much easier to see the egg cells because the queen goes along the row and is depositing eggs in all of the cells, so there's a uniformity to it, which she didn't notice. So at this point, she's gonna put everything back and go have some discussion with other beekeepers about the next steps. Thanks so much for watching. As you see, science never stops at the St. Louis Science Center. Hope you learned something new today. Okay, hey, Hannah, hey. Hi. Good to see you. Thank you, Maddie. Well, uh, for our guests who just saw the video of you working the bees, you really left us with a bit of a cliffhanger there. Uh, I know, I'm sure many people are wondering was there a queen? Is that second hive going? 
you know, what have you been able to do and what have you learned since we filmed that video about five or six weeks ago? Yeah, so reaching out to our volunteer consultant to just pick her brain on best next steps. So she advised moving um, one frame of what they call open brood. So that's um, little baby bees that haven't been capped to complete their maturity in the cell. So uh, one frame of those per week um, until the week hive like righted itself and re successfully reared a new queen. So um, I've been striving to do that as, as much as my time and, um, and weather allows. And so when I checked last week, um, I did see that they successfully, the weak hive successfully reared its, its queen. So I saw, um, I saw brood in various stages, including eggs, but it still has such few frames of brood that I'm continuing to move um, the, the frames of brood from the strong to the weak until it equalizes and really gets a good footing because there is such a huge disparity. And when I'm doing that, then that helps the strong hive not get too overcrowded because when it's thriving and, and breeding so much, then the, you risk the hive running out of room to lay. The queen might run out of space and then that'll trigger a swarm instinct um, to, you know, take some of the population and they'll just like, you know, take, take off with the queen and then you lose a lot of those good worker bees uh -huh. and it sets the whole hive back because, um, you know, at that point they're, uh, they're, they're losing so much of their population. It's so interesting, right? That you can take, um, this whole set of, I guess what you said, like brood and just move them to another place and they will just be part of that. It's really, really interesting. So, well, that's good news. That's exciting they reared a queen. Yay. The nerve wracking part about it is every time you move a, brain, a, a frame of brood, there's a chance that the queen is on it. And you really, so you have to look very carefully to make sure you're not I, stealing the queen from the, the strong hive to the weak, because then they'd have, the strong one would have to rear a new queen. So thankfully our queen um, that we got with, with our new box of bees last year was with the little color. And if that's still evident, then she'd be much easier to see. But man, with so many bees on the frame, it's really hard to be extremely confident that she's not there. Yeah, wow. Yes, that is nerve wracking. And I mean, it just goes to the point of how important it is to have training. And it's you really have to keep learning year after year. And I know I mentioned in the video, you've been keeping bees for about seven or eight years. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got started and maybe a little bit about what you wish you'd known before? Sure. Um, yeah, I got started way back um, when I used to work for an organization called Gateway Greening, and we um, met some beekeepers, uh, including the, who's now the owner, Jane Toomey, who owns Isabees. Yeah, I was. I started from a passion for gardening, you know, and understanding the role that bees can play in improving pollination, and also a love for honey. I just am an avid honey consumer, <laughs> and so I think. Some of the things that when I first got started that I didn't fully grasp um, was the amount of time and money involved. The equipment adds up quite a bit. Um, you, could, you can spend, it, the initial investment is close to $500, and then over time you will need to um, replace equipment, potentially expand, um, and also potentially if you have a failure of bees, purchase new bees altogether to stock your hive, mm. and all of that costs money um right and there's like i said the investment of time during uh, the spring and swarm season when you're having to really monitor or maybe if you have a weak hive and it takes um really regular feedings of sugar syrup to make sure that they um have the resources they need it um it limits your ability to just like peace out you know <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> yeah so yeah, it's not a it's not a situation where you just get them and let them do their thing. It, it takes management, and especially I know uh, one of the things you worried about this past year was uh, varroa mites and finding ways to check the hive for that. And I know you spent a lot of time researching that. So there's also these type of concerns that a lot of honey beekeepers have. You're absolutely right. The pest management, um, trying to practice integrated pest management techniques to um, know whether or not it's recommended to treat or not. 
yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of decisions to make. And um, yeah, it's really interesting. So we're really excited that uh, we have these honeybees now at the Science Center because it allows us to tell a lot of the stories of pollination. And I think a lot of people don't realize that honeybees are actually considered livestock and are so responsible for pollinating a lot of crops that we eat every day. And oh, what? What's this? Hello. Like this apple, for instance. <laughs> or um, even I think, I think a lot of people know this, but almonds are one of the crops that, you know, we people actually ship their honeybees to California just to pollinate those almond crops. And it's a huge business. And it's really lots of interesting stories around that and how we, what we have to do to get our almonds and how important the honeybees are for that story, for sure. Well, good. So we've had the honeybees now for about a year. Is that right? Yeah, last June. Okay. And um, I think a lot of our guests know us. They've been out to the Grow Pavilion in the summer that we also have bumblebees. So when we first opened Grow, we only had bumblebees. And can you tell a little bit, you know, tell people a little bit about the difference between bumblebees and honeybees and why would we choose to show bumblebees at the Science Center? Probably remember when I first started and I learned that the bumblebees were part of the gallery, I was kind of mystified because I, I was like, they're wild. They're you don't keep bumblebees. How are you going to keep bumblebees? And uh -huh. sure enough, <laughs> if you're able to find a source of an established colony, thankfully we are through the, the breeder copper, um, you can at least put an established hive in a box and just basically let them be as long as they're able to forage, which thankfully our exhibit allows them to do, have access to outside and come back with their nectar and pot. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I understood, you know, and I was uh, appreciated the reasoning behind the interest to keep um, bumblebees, one being that they, it is an actual native species distinct from honeybees, which came along with colonists years ago to our nation. Um, and that, that bumblebees are in many ways more efficient pollinators. So the way that they will go out in all different types of weather, well, not all different, but when it's chillier and maybe like a greater mm -hmm. threat or maybe even drizzling, they'll be out there and they, they have a more efficient like buzz and hairier to kind of, to really like pollen and disperse it better. So, um, and another reason also that is worth bringing attention is just that there are actually endangered species of bumblebees that we want to highlight from a conservationist um, perspective to be mm -hmm. able to educate people on what they can do to preserve habitat for our species. Yeah, and it's I can think another thing that has been so interesting for me, both it, partly from our work at the Science Center and getting to know more about bees is, you know, there's just not one type of bumblebee. There's so many types of bumblebees, so many types of native bees, and really understanding that while we can rear honeybees for pollination, because unlike a lot of other bees, there can be 20 to 30,000 in a hive where, you know, bumblebees, if you get 300, that's a pretty large colony. So that allows us to do that. But still how important so many of those native species are for pollination uh, of lots of different crops. And that really helps us to, you know, talk with guests about that, having them. Um, I forget the yeah. exact hundreds, I believe, I forget how many hundreds of native bumblebees to the United States, but if I'm remembering right, only six native to, to Missouri. Oh, inch of bumblebees. Right. right. Very, very cool. Love it. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get our bumblebee colony uh, installed soon. We, I know we rely a lot on the zoo to help us do that. And it's really, it's such a cool process to see the installation. And unlike honeybees, you know, you don't have to do much to manage the bumblebees, right? Right. Again, thankful that they have access to the outdoors to forage because, um, you know, when we saw the zoo's um, uh, research, they have to have a separate foraging uh, container so that they had to even buy pollen from Whole Foods and supply sugar water for them to, to forage and return. Mm. So that would be a lot of maintenance and cost if we had to buy them pollen. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. 
Right. Yeah, that was very clever. It was a really fun thing about the design of Grow to think about putting in bumblebees and allowing the fly in and out of the building. And mm -hmm. yeah, I love that about it. So Hannah, I just want to share one kind of cool thing with our um, visitors here because I can't stop myself. What? That is cool. You're yeah, ready. To thank go. you. Don't huh? get too excited. Social distancing is still, uh, you know, in place. So I know, I know. Well, people can just see these from afar. Uh, so bees, yeah, they've got these cool little, it kind of mimics the shape of bee eyes and, um, and fly eyes, I guess. But one of the cool things I've learned is that bees actually have hair on their eyes. It's that sounds crazy. uncomfortable. It does sound uncomfortable. Now these glasses do not have the hair, which makes me kind of sad because they look really cool. But, uh, I was looking a little bit about that recently and saw that having hair in so many places is what allows them to carry so much pollen. And they can carry actually up to like 30% of their body weight in pollen, which is pretty mm -hmm. fascinating. So if you look online at a lot of pictures, and even when I know I've gotten really close and looked at bees, taken a picture with my camera, you can see their whole bodies covered in pollen. And it's just, yeah, it's so cool. Think about yeah. how they move that around. Well, good. Well, any other things you think our guests should know about our honeybees or bumblebees before we end our conversation today? Well, I think just talking about what they can do to help um, bee mm -hmm. populations. Um, oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. So, I mean, even if you're not going to keep, from a, from a conservation perspective, um, providing habitat to native bees is really more important than like keeping honeybees. Um, honeybees are not you know, endangered or threatened bees despite personal losses through colony collapse disorders and other hive losses. Um, but bumblebees are and mm -hmm. um, native bees too that we haven't talked about today. So, um, you know, one thing that people could do is just mow less and, and have less lawn um, reduce the size of their lawn by half um, and provide native plants um, that provide just better food sources than other kind of imported species of plants. Uh -huh. um, and just kind of have more like brush areas that maybe not be so tidy in their yard have some leaves and sticks. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's interesting. It's like counter to what we think about as having a tidy yard. Mm -hmm. I also remember we, we learned a few years ago to like keep some areas uncovered by mulch and just kind of keep it so that there's some bare soil. And I thought it was odd <clears throat> that when you think about how many bees live underground and, you know, solitary bees that build their nests underground and bumblebees that go underground to hibernate for the winter, it makes a lot of sense to do that. So it's another thing I remember learning about that we could do. Mm -hmm. So yes, mowing less, leaving some bare ground, planting native flowers, and there's lots of good resources online for finding, I guess, good plants for that. Yeah, there's a great resource um, specific to Missouri. Through the could you say that one again? Grow Native. Grow Native, right. Grow Native. The Missouri Prairie Foundation. Okay. Wonderful. Good. Well, yay. This has been delightful. Um, yeah. Hopefully, uh, to anyone watching, you've learned something new about bees today. And uh, we will look forward to having more conversations in the future. And thank you so much for watching.